The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said to the 12, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward, and whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Sisters, brothers, siblings in Christ, and most especially this day, Ali and Kevin. <laughs> Grace and peace to you from the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we bid farewell to Kevin as he heads off to his PhD work and Ali off to start seminary, I happen to recall some time ago someone asking me to share what it's like to be a pastor. <laughs> I understood when they asked me that question that it was not supposed to something to be done with uh, s some sort of self-serving motivation or just be me spending time complaining in any kind of way. <laughs> I say that because I remember growing up a pastor who once compared the members of the congregation that he was pastoring not to, to herding sheep, but to herding cats. <laughs> and at no point in time did he ever say, and I wouldn't have it any other way, <laughs> Or nor did he ever confess that there was no sense that he was a willful cat either. It was just whine, whine, whine. So with that in mind, what's it like to be a pastor? Based on conversations I've had with first-time parents, the beginning of ministry is kind of like that. There is this romantic, idealistic daydream about little league and playing catch, ballet slippers and pink tutus, baby giggles, bedtime stories, and Christmas surprises. Oh sure, you know there are going to be late night feedings and smelly dirty diapers, but still, those are minor and compared to the glories of holding your sweet, innocent baby. And when the baby comes, and you reach out to take hold of your dreams, you take hold of reality. <laughs> and you learn just how long some of those nights will really be, and just how dirty and smelly some of those <laughs> diapers will be. You discover what it's like to be peed on, <laughs> and barfed on, <laughs> and that baby poop sometimes defies even gravity itself. <laughs> And as time goes on, you experience sibling rivalry from the other side, the loss of personal space, and all the other mayhem that happens in a family where people are actively trying to figure out what it means to be a self and stay connected, even when some of them don't really want to. I, too, had certain daydreams about what being a pastor would be like. Involved me sitting in a nice leather chair, reading and studying, writing sermons, and, and sitting with people seeking my counsel. I would remember people's names the first time and not get them mixed up. I would teach lots of Bible studies, and they would all be well attended. Sure, I knew there would be things that I needed to learn in seminary that would be difficult, and that there would be troubles in congregations. But what did that all compare to the glories of being a pastor called by God? And then, as I went to seminary to reach out for my dreams, I took hold of reality and learned things about the Bible that shook my faith to its foundation. I took classes about pastoral boundaries and ethics that if I and all my classmates practiced in order to avoid miscommunications and, and being sued, We'd all be fired in, from our calls in the first year for being distant, uncaring, unfeeling, sorry excuses for pastors. And then when I went to take hold of reality in the congregation, I learned how long those nights can really be when you're walking with people through their fears and doubts. 
and just how dirty the tricks can be that some people will really play. I discovered what it's like to have parishioners vying for your attention to take their side in the fight and all the mayhem that happens when multiple family systems collide in a church family where people are actively trying to figure out what it means to be a forgiven sinner and stay connected, even when some of them really don't want to. While I would have it another way, I, like you and so many others, just keep coming back. <laughs> we reach out for our illusions, but take hold of reality. It's as though God tricked us through our daydreams, but in the end, gets us to where and who we need to be in life. That's what Jeremiah lamented last week. God, you tricked me, and now all I do is shout vengeance or violence and destruction. He would have had it another way, but whenever he tried to keep silent, the spirit just rose up in him, and he was right back doing what God needed him to do. The same is true for, for Peter and Paul. Paul had visions of, of persecuting the church, and in the end, he was suffering for it gladly. He would have had it another way, but discovered he could do all things through Christ, who strengthened him. When Jesus called Peter and the rest of the disciples to follow, they had visions of golden thrones, servants to fluff their pillows, and, and people lined up to see them now because they were somebodies. They knew the Messiah on a first-name basis. They were on the inside track and had what everybody else wanted. They were the ultimate insiders. Of course, every once in a while, their visions collided with one another, like who got the best throne, who got a right shotgun with Jesus, and, and who had to sit in the middle, squished middle seat in the back. And as they reached out for their dreams, they took hold of the truth. They learned that to sit with Jesus at his left and right would involve suffering. And that Jesus would take the undesirable middle seat, you know, between two thieves hanging on a cross. Reality was, Jesus didn't need servants to fluff his pillows because there were no pillows to fluff. But there were feet to wash, tears to dry, children to bless, and adults to comfort and afflict. Jesus didn't need servants because he was the servant. What he needed was co-workers to feed the lambs and tend the sheep with him. I think each in our own way, we have reached out for our illusions of soft, fluffy lambs, and in reality, we have signed up for being part of a church family that isn't all that romantic, but it is real. And as Jesus' co-workers, sometimes that means we get offered a welcome and a cup of cold water, and at other times we get barfed on and are given the cold shoulder. So what's it like being a pastor? It's like being the designated person in the family who's responsible for being the first one to stand up and confess, God tricked me. I had all these wonderful dreams which God used to, to lure me in, only to show me that they were all ultimately illusions. But you know what? It was only after those illusions died that I really started to understand and be able to see what it was that God has been up to. God delivered me from my own ideas about who I am and, and what I think I'm supposed to be doing and showed me God's own idea of whose I am and what God is up to which generally passes all understanding. And then I am to sit down so that you can stand up each and confess the same experience, and then collectively we are to live in this new reality, this new servant life of feeding lambs and tending sheep, of washing feet and drying tears, of blessing children and speaking to strangers, for better or for worse. It may not be much to go on, but one, I think, but one thing I think we can count on is that God's idea will have no illusions in it. 
It will be as real as any of the people who present themselves to us each day, asking for attention, for love, for conflict, for any proof that they matter to us and to God. This may not be the life that we had planned, nor what we expected, but it is the life that God is pleased to give us because it is the life that God and Jesus first lived with us. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Amen. Amen. Amen.